Hey, Doxology. Honored to be worshiping with you this morning, wherever you're joining us from. You know, obviously, there are still a lot of things that are still really hard with the season that we're in, and so many people still needing to re worship remotely for now. One of the consistently cool stories we're hearing are about groups of people joining together with family or friends, groups of people all over the world who are worshiping together and then talking about it, even though they're spread out all over the world. This week, I heard about a group of people in Sweden who are joining us most weeks, along with some people right here in Fort Worth. Really cool. And Valkomen to y'all in Sweden this morning. Glad you guys are here. Hey, grab a Bible and meet me in 1 Kings 10 today. 1 Kings 10. This is week four in a series we've called Living the Dream, where we're looking at the life of a guy who did. In the area of influence and relationships and wealth, relationship with God. In some ways, he's a person that had it all. But in other ways, it turns out he's a guy none of us want to end up like. So we're trying to learn from both sides of that in his life so we can avoid one side of that in our life. This week we're in 1 Kings chapter 10, and we catch Solomon at the very top of his game, the moment when everything comes together. And it's really important for us to see that because next week we're going to look at how and why it all falls apart. And then for the last week of the series, we're going to look back at Solomon's life from his own perspective as he tells us the lessons that he learned. But this week, he's the king of the mountain. The last Sunday and Monday, somewhere north of 28 million people in the United States and in Great Britain tuned in to watch the interview. Oprah Winfrey interviewed the Queen of England's grandson, Harry, and his wife, Meghan, about their experiences from inside the royal family. 28 million people watched it, which means there are somewhere around 28 million opinions and hot takes and perspectives about what Harry and Meghan revealed to all of us. And add to that the millions of people who really intentionally didn't watch the interview because of what they believed it would be, and you end up with just about everybody in the world thinking and talking about the royal family this week. And the conversations and the concerns and the assumptions, the opinions, all boil down to one big question. The closer we get what would we find? And you know, it's an interesting question to debate and discuss, and it's maybe even an important conversation for some people to have related to the royal family. It's an absolutely essential question for every single one of us to ask about ourselves. The closer people look at my life, what or who will they find? Have you ever had the experience? A few years ago, I was traveling through Spain with one of our mission partners, driving across the country where we could see what looked like a magnificent castle in the distance, way out in the middle of nowhere. And we had a little bit of time, so I said, hey, could we detour over there and check that place out? And Manny, the guy I was traveling with, said, you don't really want to do that. Trust me. And sure enough, the closer we got, even from a distance, the less magnificent it looked. Gutted out, abandoned, ruins. It looked like a fairy tale castle from a distance, but the closer you got to it, the less it resembled the dream. Or maybe you've experienced it the other way. Devil's Tower in Wyoming or El Capitan in California appear on the horizon and you sort of think, ho-hum, you know, it looks like a rock stump sticking out of the ground, no big deal. But the closer you get, the more magnificent they are until you get right up close and they take your breath away. That's the question that this piece of Solomon's story invites us to examine in four big areas of our lives. The closer people look at our life, what or who do they find? What conclusion are they left with? Is it better or worse than they imagined it would be from a distance? And what's the reason that they give for what they see in us? Look at 1 Kings chapter 10. It's a story that may be at least vaguely familiar to you. Let me just read the whole thing. And if you've got a hard copy Bible in front of you, I'll give you a couple of things to circle and underline that we'll come back to. 1 Kings chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, says this. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon, now circle this next part or underline it, whatever you want to do, and his relationship to the Lord, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Now do something different, whether you underline or circle there. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices and large quantities of gold and precious stones, she came to Solomon and talked with him about all she had on her mind. 
Solomon answered her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon, the palace that he'd built, check this out or underline it, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, the cup daughters, the burnt offerings that he made at the temple of the Lord. She was overwhelmed. Literally, it took her breath away. She said to the king, the report I've heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true. But I didn't believe these things until I came and saw it with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told to me. In, underline this, wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report that I heard. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Now circle this part, whatever you did at the very beginning. Praise be to the Lord your God who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel because of the Lord's, underline this, under, eternal love for Israel. He's made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. It's an incredible story. Let's just go back and talk our way through it. Okay, really, at the end of the day, it's a story, isn't it, about a wealthy, powerful, influential, successful person who, despite all of it, realizes she's still missing something, who goes on a 1,200-mile journey, either walking or riding a camel, because she's heard about a person that she could relate to who has found the thing she's looking for. And she gets right up close, checks out his life, and literally the story said, it takes her breath away. She said, it's more than twice as good as it seemed to be from a distance. And at the end of the story, she heads back home believing that she too has found what she'd been looking for. And she's found it in the person and the promises of the one true God. So here's what I want to do for us this morning. I want to just talk us through the four big areas of Solomon's life that led her to that conclusion, at least the ones that are clearest in this passage. And I want to give us some diagnostic questions to ask about our own lives. But don't worry, I'll land the plane with some hope. For those of us who don't like the answer we come up with when we take an up-close look at our own life. But first, look back at the passage with me at some of the things you underlined there. Four things the Queen of Sheba sees up close and personal in the life of Solomon that caused her to conclude that a life, L-I-F-E, connected to the one true God is truly the best way to live. The first thing you see is the L, if you're taking notes, right? Leadership, or maybe labor and logic. When you think leadership, don't forget, leadership simply means influence. It doesn't mean a title or an office or a role necessarily. If you have influence in the life of anyone, you have leadership responsibility towards someone, right? Whether it's kids or grandkids or employees or a team you serve on here or neighbors or friends who look to you or who give you the ability to influence them in some way, the closer they get to your leadership, what or who does it point to? We talked about Solomon's work last week, how he believed his work and the work of his people and ultimately our work is an opportunity to reflect attributes of God with abilities from God toward the agenda of God for the life of the world. And the Queen of Sheba comments on that, but where she really focuses is on the logic piece of his leadership. You underline that in the second half of verse 1. She came to test Solomon with, this is what you underline, hard questions. And it's interesting, some of your translations may say, test him with riddles. But all of the scholars that you read on this are pretty quick to note, she's not just trying to trick him with gotcha or impossible questions like, what does the color blue smell like? Or did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Not that kind of question. That's not the idea here. She's not here asking just gotcha questions. She's asking about difficult, diplomatic, and ethical questions in the real world where they live. She's trying to figure out if he's trustworthy. And if he's reliable as an ally or even a friend, she's asking, is this the kind of guy who actually thinks through a problem and tries to give a wise, reasoned response? Or is he just a shoot from the hip kind of person who responds only in emotion? Is he easily deceived by what we would call fake news, misinformation? Or is he able to see things with perspective and nuance where it's necessary and with clarity and conviction where it's called for? Is he humble? Is he thoughtful? Is he clear? Isn't that what she's trying to discover here? 
Is Solomon the kind of person who can navigate the difficult questions of the day with grace and humility and truth and skill? What she finds is not only is he that, his leadership, the labor he does, as well as his logic, the way he thinks, point to a perspective for navigating the real world in real time that could only come from a person who has a God's eye view. So if you're looking up close and personal at your own life, and specifically at your leadership, that's the first question to ask. When it comes to leadership, our logic and our labor, where do my conversations point? When it comes to the complicated, complex, difficult conversations of our day, okay, can I hit you kind of hard? When people in your sphere of influence, however big or small it is, when they walk away from a conversation with you, neighbors, family, friends, people in your community group, people in your office, do they come away with the conclusion, that's a person that spent a lot of time listening to Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. That's a person who has an opinion that has been fully formed by the people of Facebook. Or do they walk away from a conversation with you saying, that person sounds and thinks like a person who spent some time with Jesus. And you know, we talk a lot about how Jesus lived in a world full of grace and truth, never sacrificing one or the other. People in conversation with him were never unclear about his perspective on an issue or his posture towards them. And they were clear about both things at the same time. So that's the question. The closer people get to you, do your conversations point towards that, towards him, with the people in your sphere of influence? Okay, that's the first thing we see in Solomon, leadership. Where do my conversations point? The second thing that the Queen of Sheba looks at is his integrity. You see it in verse 5. She looked at the food on his table, and she looks at the seating of his officials, and the attending of his servants, and the robes, and the cutbearers, and the burnt offerings that he made at the temple of the Lord. She looks at the whole enchilada, Solomon's whole life, and she discovers it fits together. That's what integrity means. Solomon doesn't have a leisure time part of his life and a board of directors part of his life and a this is me as the boss part of his life and a this is me at worship part of his life and a this is me at home part of his life that all point in different directions. She sees all of it and all of it points in the same direction toward the same conclusion. Remember the conclusion? This is a guy who, verse 1, has a relationship with God who, verse 9, delights in him too. Okay, so the leadership question is a conversation question. The simplest way I know how to diagnose the integrity question in my life is to sit down with my calendar. It's the calendar question. Where does my calendar point? When I'm looking at all of the places that I'm going this week and all of the things that I have planned, all of the circles that I'm running in and the people that I'm meeting with, am I living a fragmented life that points in 20 different directions? Or is it a life of integrity, a life in which my work life and my home life and my hobby life and my church life all point in the direction of a connection with the one true God? The closer people get to the things on my calendar, what would they conclude about me? You know, the third thing that you see in Solomon's story here is a big one that some of us don't love to talk about, and we sure don't love our preacher to talk about. It's leadership, integrity, and thirdly, finances. But the Queen of Sheba calls it out explicitly in verse 7. She says, In wisdom and wealth you have far exceeded the report that I heard. And it's not just about how much he had. It's also about where he points it. A couple of things to point out real quick. First is that Solomon had a whole lot of wealth. That was the blessing of God that God never asked Solomon to apologize for receiving or enjoying. You know, I think some of us that aren't rich feel like sometimes having wealth is somehow an indication that a person really doesn't love Jesus. I mean, if they did, they'd give all their wealth away and live poor like us. God never treats wealth that way. And He also never treats wealth as the inevitable result of a connection with God. The question of the Bible when it comes to money is never how much or how little, but how do you see it and where does it point? So really a little like fire, right? A really useful tool, but the more of it you have, the more careful you have to be. Because as soon as you're careless, even for a moment, 
it can become awfully destructive. And that's important, even though most of us don't think of ourselves as rich. Most of the rest of the world does. I'll never forget being in Dominican Republic several years ago working with Compassion International. One of the teenagers that was there serving as a translator started talking about me as a rich guy. And she was teasing me just a little bit. And I'm like, no, that's not me. Like, I'm not rich. And I'm looking around at some of the other people with me on that trip thinking, but that guy is, right? But she looks at me and kind of joking around with me, she says, you got a car? And I said, yeah. She said, you got a house? I said, yeah. She said, you got a house for your car? I said, yeah. She said, I literally don't know anyone in my country who has two of those three things, much less all three. And I thought, holy cow, I'm rich. And you are too, even if you don't have those things. And that's not to make you feel guilty, but it is to ask you a question. Look, rich people, Solomon was rich. The queen of Sheba was rich. She looks at his life and specifically in the passage at his hospitality and his generosity. And she comes away with the conclusion that he had a relationship with God who delighted in him, not because of how much he had, but because of where he pointed what he had, how he enjoyed it how he employed it, and where he invested it. It all combined together in a way that helped her look at his life and conclude that it wasn't just more money she was missing. It was the direction his finances, his wealth were pointing. So this is the checkbook question. Finances, where does my checkbook point? If you're not old enough to know what a checkbook is, we're talking about your bank statements, okay? Or your Mint or Quicken account, or really your whole investment portfolio, whatever that looks like, anything you own, house, cars, cash, investments, all of it. And look, the question isn't a line item question I'm trying to ask you. I'm not taking a back door to a do you give enough to doxology question, okay? If you consider yourself a part of doxology, I hope that's a priority for you. It should be a priority for you. That is not the question that I'm asking. I'm asking a bigger question. I'm not asking about 10% or 5% or 15% of your paycheck. I'm asking about all of your wealth. And I'm not asking you to give it, but I am asking where you aim it. Some of that may turn out to be generosity. Some of it may be hospitality. You invite others to enjoy it with you, to be blessed alongside you. And again, it's not about a financial position. I know relatively poor people who are terrible at aiming the little that they have. And I know fabulously wealthy people who enjoy their wealth. But when I'm around them and other people are around them, people are never, ever confused about which direction their wealth points. Not about a financial position. It's about a heart position. What do people conclude or what would they conclude the closer they get to the resources you have? Would it be simple or really challenging for you to have a conversation with your CPA or the person who does your taxes, about the God who directs your life? Or would they get an up-close look at your life and the way you're aiming what you have and find, just like the Queen of Sheba, it takes their breath away? Last one is this. Leadership, integrity, finances, and eternal focus. And you catch it in verse 9. I think this is amazing. The king, queen gets ready to leave. She says this. Because of the Lord's, did you catch this, eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. See, she gets an upfront and personal look at his life and comes away with the conclusion that his leadership, his integrity, his finances all point to an eternal plan and the eternal love that God has for the specific people that he'd placed Solomon near. Well, where does she come up with that? Well, the only explanation is that along the way, Solomon made it clear. There's no way she would have known this, no way she would have discovered it or connected those dots of God's specific promise to Solomon or to the people near Solomon and through them to the ends of the earth unless Solomon had explained it to her clearly, directly, and specifically. Okay, so this is the clarity question. The clarity question. Eternal focus, 
Have I made the aim of my life clear? Look, Solomon could have settled for being a nice rich guy and a good friend who was a good consultant, good ally, good business partner, good boss, good leader, whose life fit seamlessly together, who was hospitable and even generous, and who sent the queen of Sheba back to Sheba overwhelmed with what a great guy he was. But walking 1,200 miles back home with only a vague answer to the most important question of her life. And Solomon didn't let that happen. He connected the dots of his life to the God that he served in a way that made it clear where he believed his life came from. His life was not just a vague road sign along a dangerous journey of life that pointed in the general vicinity of hope. It was an explicit clear sign that directed the queen to the specific person and promises of the one true God that Solomon's life came from and pointed to. Solomon's story shows us a guy at the top of his game whose life, leadership, integrity, finances, and eternal focus points to a specific person of God in a way that allows a person who comes near him to investigate his life and go back home proclaiming, surely God is among you. And the question Solomon's life invites you and me to ask is, could people, would people in our life reach the same conclusion the closer they come to us? And if you don't like the answer to that question, I've got great news for you. A thousand years after this story, a man named Jesus steps on the scene and looks back at this story. You find it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42. He's talking to religious people whose life didn't reflect any of this at all. And he's challenging them to look at the story differently. Look at Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 42. Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now, something greater than Solomon is here. You see what Jesus does? He recognizes when we put ourselves in Solomon's shoes, we're always going to fall short. And Jesus says, look, I won't fall short. In fact, I'll exceed even Solomon. So if you don't fit as Solomon in the story, if you realize that there's something he has that you're missing, put yourself in the shoes of the other character. Be like the Queen of Sheba. Jesus says, look, look at me. Run your hard questions through me. Look how I lead and how I hold everything together. Look how I handle the resources in my hands and listen to how clear I am about where you'll find the life you're trying to find. See, Solomon was a flawed example too. We'll talk about that next week. But even a flawed example was enough for the Queen of Sheba to conclude that a life following the one true God was twice as good as the life she was living, the one she imagined. How much more might an up-close look at Jesus be exactly what you're looking for? And the rebuke to the religious leaders in Jesus' day was this. They weren't even willing to look. So that's the question for us this morning. Are you willing to look? Here's where some of us find ourselves today. The rumors of God's grace has reached us from a long way away, maybe even all the way to Sweden. A wise, wealthy king who may be able to show us an abundant life beyond anything we've ever experienced. And I'm not talking about Solomon. Greater than Solomon. Jesus himself who lived his life and gave his life to give you life to live and will live his life through you as you trust in him. Are you at least willing to look up close at him to see for yourself? And here's what I think you'll find in Jesus, what I found in Jesus. It's even better than you could imagine. You know, there are some of us who have trusted in Jesus but we realize by looking at Solomon's example that there are some holes right up close in our life, some places that have fallen into disrepair. And the question is, 
Do you believe this? Do you believe that a life following Jesus is really the best way to live life with your leadership, with your whole life, not just the Sunday morning part, with your finances and with your clear conversations about eternity, who Jesus is, what he's like, what he promises, what he's done with the people that you know and love. And if you don't believe this in one area or another, the answer from Jesus isn't try harder, do better, get it together. It's simply, hey, look to me. Bring your questions to me. Investigate outcomes with me. Watch my generosity and my hospitality and the focus with which I live my life. And I won't make the conclusion for you, but here's what you'll find if you're willing to look at him. A life of following Jesus isn't just the right thing to do. It's the very best way to live. Would you bow your head with me? If you're ready to say yes to Jesus this morning, you can do it right where you sit. In your own words to say, Jesus, I need your life. And I believe you came to live your life and give your life so that I could have a real life to live. And I'm putting my trust in you this morning. And Lord, for the person who's connecting with you for the very first time today, and for those of us who are needing a different kind of next step from this place, maybe in one of these areas, Lord, as we look at our conversations and our calendar and our checkbook and the clarity with which we're living our life, and when we realize it doesn't look like we hope that it would live, would you let us find correction, but have courage to take a step on the journey toward a long, hard look and trust in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.